to the Ventura County Astronomical Society's March 16, 2021 general meeting. My name is Reza, and I'm the vice president of the Orange County Astronomers, reporting live to you from the Mission Control Room. OCA is happy to join forces with ECAS to make this event happen. Before we start the main talk, I would like to point out to you the ways in which you can interact with us. First is the raise hand function. Please go ahead and find the raise hand button and click on it. This is how we're going to applaud our speaker shortly. Let me see, I see hand raised, thank you very much. Second, look for the chat menu item. This is how you can send us any comments you may have during and after the talk. And third and last, please find the Q&A option on your screen and look for the ask a question button. This is where you can ask our speaker questions during and after his presentation. With this, I'm handing it over to Keith to introduce tonight's speaker. Keith. Reza, thank you very much. I'm Keith Salvis, president of the Ventura County Astronomical Society. I'd like to welcome all of the members of the Orange County Astronomers and all of the Ventura County Astronomical Society members, as well as those who have joined us through uh, Facebook and other medium where we advertise online. Welcome, we have a great show for you tonight and I won't take too much of your time before introducing our guest, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, but I would like to introduce to you Todd Mitchell, our calendar maven he put together an extraordinary calendar both last year and this year and our vice president of programs david Contreras. thank you both ventura county astronomical society society celebrates 50 years of bringing astronomy to ventura county residents this year we have done so without prejudice and we're proud to announce that we have amended our bylaws and we have written into our bylaws a non-discrimination policy. Ventura County Astronomical Society, when we get back to meeting in person at the Moore Park College Forum, at the Moore Park College Observatory, or wherever we go, it is a safe place. You come as you are. We're here to enjoy astronomy together. We do not discriminate. We're very proud of that. Now, having said that, our guest tonight, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, has spent 17 field seasons in the jungles of West Central Belize studying the classic Maya. That's about AD 250 to 900. Andrew's archaeological research focuses on a string of 25 cenotes. These are water-filled sinkholes located in the Cara Blanca regions of Belize and how the ancient Maya used these cenotes during water rituals. That's going to factor into his talk tonight, but tonight he's going to talk about ancient Mayan astronomy. Here's the thing. When we look up at the skies, we see Greek gods. When the Mayan took up, looked up at the skies, they saw something slightly different than us. And we're going to learn more about that. So without any further ado, it's a pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Andrew Kinkella. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Keith. Thanks for that really kind uh, intro. And uh, everyone give me one moment as I share my screen. There we go. Minor te technical difficulty for a second while I was muted. Uh, so uh, we, we are back. So I, I did a presentation very similar to this just over a year ago, actually just before COVID. It was one of the last kind of big group things that that I, I did. And um, it just, it seems like so long ago, you know, now. So um, this presentation is similar to that last. If you saw the last one, there will be some similarities. There'll be some differences. Um, if you see something you saw before, just take it out like a fine wine, you know, pour it, enjoy it a little. Oh, I remember this, ah, oh, yes. Uh, and just kind of enjoy it along with me. I think having these kind of uh, remote talks is so very healthy for all of us in this kind of, of situation and please, as I go through with this talk, 
feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, I, I won't be following the chat, but the moderators will be. And after the presentation is over, I'm more than happy to answer anything. So, you know, please uh, don't, don't be shy, a ask your questions and we'll, we'll enjoy the, the evening. I will also say that, that the Ventura County uh, Astronomical Society, the VCAS, to me is the other VCAS because um, I am the vice president currently of the Ventura County Archaeological Society, the other VCAS uh, who meets um, second Tuesdays of every week at 730, if you are curious about that kind of thing. So, um, but as for the Maya, first and foremost, where are the Maya? And they are in Mesoamerica, right? Central America. And you can see that on, on this map, Belize is, is shown kind of front row center because that's where I work. But for the, the Maya area, when you hear of pyramids in the jungle and these um, sort of fantastic uh, cities of, of long ago, they, they might be in Guatemala, they might be in uh, Southern Mexico, and there are even Maya sites in El Salvador and Honduras as well. So it's really this entire region that is, is the land of the Maya. And beyond that, there are other cultures related to the Maya too. You'll hear, you'll hear archeologists like me say things like, oh, me is it Mesoamerican? Because there's, there's other cultures like the Olmec, which are in this area, the later Aztec, which would be in this area, and, and several others where they're all different. They do have um, general, like a generally similar base, if that makes sense. Like their belief system is similar and they all grow corn and their social structure is similar. So while the Maya are probably the most well-known, of all the Mesoamerican cultures, um, they are interrelated to those that came before and, and after. So as we zoom in a little bit closer uh, in, in this Maya world, where do I work? I work in this sort of grayed out area over here called the uh, Carablanca pools in the Carablanca region. For those of you out there who are Spanish speakers, uh, Carablanca means white face. And that region is called Cara Blanca or white face because there's some cliffs right next to these series of pools and the cliffs are limestone and they're very white. So you actually see the white face of this, of this area. Now, zooming in a little closer. So we're gonna zoom in. The next slide is gonna be like right in there. Oh, and actually before I do, uh, some of the very famous Maya sites are shown on this map. So you can see things like Tikal's right there and Kalakmul. Those were those were two huge sites in the classic period. Um, some of you may have may have been to like uh, Chichen Itza, Nisari, uh, you, you know, um, there, there are many others. You might may even have heard of places like Karakol, um, Yasha. These are big, big Maya sites. But as we zoom in here, there we go, an actual aerial photo of the Carablanca pools. So what attracted me to this area is I was, I was so fortunate because an archeologist by the name of Dr. Lisa Lucero was, was working here and she's my long-term friend. We, we had worked on a, another project together previously and uh, she started a project in this area and there happened to be these these pools in the jungle, if you, if you guys can see all these numbered, these little dark ones, some are big like pool six and some are smaller like pool two. Those are all natural sinkholes that have filled with water because of the water table. Some are very deep up to like 240 feet deep or so. And some are quite shallow, like six feet deep. So there's like a big variety in these pools. And um, Lisa was working in this, in this general area on on larger Maya sites, but I saw on her map that she had this area with all these pools. And I'm like, oh my God, Lisa, you know, could I work there? And she's like, sure. I, I had happened to already have my scuba diving certification. So um, it was one of those fantastic moments for me where I could use something that I already had a skill set in. You know, I always tell my students to do that. You know, if, if whatever your passion is, it's great if you can bring kind of a second passion in and work them both together. So I was, I was truly fortunate to be able to 
do my research. And what my research was, was I um, walked out into the jungle and went to these pools. And then I, I would survey around them for ancient Maya structures. Sometimes they had them, sometimes they didn't. And then I would uh, either swim or dive in the pools as well, looking for Maya artifacts and this kind of thing. And then I could talk about larger questions like, which of these pools related to big centers, which ones didn't, which ones were used for ritual, which ones weren't, you know, this, this kind of thing. So in the early days, we would, we would do things like this. This is one of the first maps I made. And you'll notice that by the side of pool one, there are these little structures. So the, the ancient Maya of the classic period, maybe around, in this case, around 800 AD or so, um, built these structures around this pool. That almost assures that there's some sort of meaning. There's something going on here. They're not gonna take time. These structures are hard to make. I mean, this is in the middle of the jungle. These uh, are made of nice stone blocks that, that they would have had to uh, take out from the surrounding area and really spend time. This That took a long time to build some of this stuff. So it was an investment. Uh, and you are going to do that likely in this case and because we're actually very far away from a lot of the major centers for likely ritual purposes. Um, as I went on with my work, I, I uh, sort of explored more of these pools. And again, one of these, this happens to be pool 16, but just a beautiful image. You know, I just, every time I see this, I'm just like, man, I, I was there. That was me. I didn't see that in a movie somewhere. You know, uh, it, it, I, I, it's just, Oh, it's fascinating, you know, to, and, and to come across one of these things, you know, for the first time, you literally, you really are pulling the jungle to the side and going, oh my God, we, we didn't, this pool, we didn't find it for a couple years. It was hidden. It, it, it's small enough that you couldn't see it on the Google image. So um, it, it pays to look on ground. Many of you may have heard of things like LIDAR, um, this is, is modern mapping equipment that can see through the jungle. And it really can, uh, because it has to do with the jungle will move a little bit and they'll shoot all these laser beams down. And so you can see ancient Maya structures and this kind of stuff. And it makes aspects of our work easier, but you always have to go down and check it out, you know, because the LIDAR is just a tool. Uh, any other kind of mapping equipment, it's just a tool. You know, you need human beings down there uh, locating these archaeological sites. So, you know, students of mine will say things like, well, now that there's LIDAR, you know, do you even need to go there anymore? And the answer is absolutely. It, you, you need to put in the hard work just as much as you always did. Um, we are nowhere near this idea of, oh, hasn't everything been found? N not at all. Not at all. So um, archaeology will remain fascinating for, for centuries. Um, now, I was spending most of my time actually looking for ancient Maya remains and, and things like broken pieces of pottery, stone tools, the types of things the ancient Maya would have used at the time. But we accidentally found a giant sloth. Oops. And in this case, this image um, is from 60 feet down in one of the Carablanca pools in, in pool one. And what you see here is that is, I believe, yeah, that's the, that's like the femur of the giant sloth. It's a part of the femur. And so if you compare it to the diver who is closer to the screen, um, that's, you know, big and heavy. And that is just the leg bone. So there's basically an entire giant sloth skeleton in here at 60 feet down. And how did we find this? Why did we find this? Because this, was sitting at 60 feet down and we scuba dove down thinking we're gonna pick up the Maya pot. Look at it. Like, doesn't it look like a, a piece of ceramic? Like, it looks like a ceramic pot. It's brown, it's sort of a, almost a reddish brown. It, it looks, that's what they look like if they're whole. So at first we were super excited that we were like, oh my God, we found a, a whole, a complete Maya pot at 60 feet down uh, in the cenote. But then we went up to take it and was like, uh, uh. It's, it was stuck, you know, in the ground because it was a fossil. Now, what is this? It's the ball joint of the giant sloth. 
So it's it's that part right there. And look how big it, it is. I, I labeled this slide my famous boot because that's my boot. And I actually took this photo and it ended up in, I believe, National Geographic Online. So um, I don't like to brag, but I am a National Geographic photographer. Just want to throw that out. Uh, I, I, actually seeing it in a place like that, I'm like, oh my God, that's my, that's my shoe. My, my, my shoes on, you know, it's just these, these funny things happen uh, in, in archaeology kind of kind of behind the scenes. But I, I threw it there. There's a method to my madness. When you're out there in the middle of the jungle, sometimes you don't have a scale. So um, I, I put it there just just so there's a scale when you take the photo, you know, so so we have some idea of, of its of its size. Um, and th this is another one. This is the giant sloth tooth. We had we have since. Um, dated the giant sloth fossil to about 27,000 years old, um, which, is, which is amazing because it's actually, and this gets beyond the ancient Maya, right on the edge of when the first people ever came to the new world. So a giant sloth fossil is cool enough, but if we had found a human spear point inside the giant sloth, then we could retire. You know, what I mean, I mean, that that would be amazing. And it, it's it's on the edge of possibility, my friends. Cla classically, um, human beings probably didn't get to the new world until maybe 17 or 18,000 years ago currently. But we might push that date back. Uh, tune in next year. Now, zooming back to the Maya, I, I just wanted to give you kind of a taste of, of some of the more recent and just sort of fascinating things that can happen when you're working in the Maya world. You have to, you know, sort of keep your mind open because uh, we didn't expect to find a giant sloth. You know, we were looking for Maya pottery. This is just the um, basic breakdown of Maya prehistory from uh, pre-classic times into the post-classic. And really, as I, as I tell my students, the pre-classic is a time of firsts. This is when like the first pyramids are gonna be built. This is when you're gonna first get kings and queens. The beginning of the pre-classic is gonna be like small villages, you're growing corn, this kind of stuff. By the end of the pre-classic, you have huge pyramids and kings and queens. The classic is a time of mosts, you know, the biggest pyramids, the, the most powerful kings and queens. The terminal classic is the famous Maya collapse. Where, where many of these big towns, or these big cities, I should say, um, are abandoned and nobody ever comes back. Not all, it's, it's interesting. There's a, there's a I, I would say a mosaic of, of differences throughout the jungle where some places totally, totally abandoned, other places hmm, kind of made it through. And then finally you have the post-classic where um, the Maya kind of get it back together and, and, and do it one more time. You know, and then and then around 1530 is when is when Europeans first come. So when we think of the classic Maya, we think of places like this. This is Tikal. This is famous, uh, the most famous of Maya sites. And I know, you know, we are an uh, astronomical society, and I'm sure many of you have seen Star Wars, and many of you recognize this much more as the planet Yavin. Uh, and and it's so fascinating and fantastic that George Lucas is going to use it, you know, as an as an alien world. I mean, we literally have pyramids poking out of an ancient jungle canopy. You know, um, I'm pretty lucky with my work sometimes. So, uh, but underneath this all, there's a belief system behind lots of this, and it's fun to kind of put the pieces together in terms of maybe how did the Maya think? You know, what was it like to be them a thousand years ago? How did they see themselves in their relation to the world and the cosmos? I know you're like, Kinkel, you're like 12 slides slides in. When's the when's the astronomy part? It's coming. Here we here we go. So um what 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 does this all mean? Now ancient Maya sites are classically aligned often. There's there's many al alignments that we can find there. They may be aligned to like north, south, and east and west, you know, cardinal directions. Um, there is often, not always, but way more than average caves underneath. Like, like a, a, a large Maya site will have some sort of cave system underground. Um, and, uh, and they will have pyramids on the top that their size 
connects to the world of the sky. So the city itself is like a living cosmogram where you have this cave underneath of the underworld, a real cave. Um, the world of the now where you live in the city and then these big pyramids going up to the world of the sky, right? It's great stuff. Now, beyond the world of the underground and the world of the sky, um, you are living in a quatripartite world that is a four-sided world, right? Um, and also a center. Now, for the Maya, I would, I would argue that the, the most important direction was actually east. I wouldn't be surprised if you asked an ancient Maya person from like 800 AD if they, to draw you a map, if they put east at the top, just because it, it, everything relates to east. And when you think about it, it's like, why do you need everything to relate to north? You know, the, it, all you really need to do is have everybody agree on the one, you know, whatever it is, north, south, east, west, whatever, as long as you take one and, and stick with it. And I can even argue to you why east would be better, you know? Um, what happens in the East? Oh, you know, that big bright ball in the sky that gives us life comes up from there. That's pretty important to me, you know? So we, we can see the importance of the East and, and often in, in Maya belief, if you look at a, at a Maya site, they might bury their ancestors in the Eastern structure, you know, just to, to venerate the ancestors because East is so important. And then they also kind of color coded the directions too. The most important is East was red, but there is also a center. And um, centrality was seen as green uh, and it is symbolized by the world tree. Now, when you look, I believe my next slide. Yes. Um, when, when, you, when you look at, at some Maya imagery, you'll see this cross thing. And you'll be like, oh, that must just be like a you know, Catholic cross or something. No, it's the symbol of the Maya world tree. And, uh, and you can also see when Catholicism came to the Maya world, where certain aspects of it, they could, they could understand, they could get it. You know, it's like, oh, we have a world tree. And if you see like an image of Christ, you'd be like, oh, and you put your God on the world tree. See, you know, so where a religion from elsewhere can be made sense of through um, the beliefs of the, of the original culture. And this very important Im imagery here that has to do with, with the cosmos. So this is the great leader, Pakal, a real person who... Um, ruled at the center of Palenque, real, real center, uh, major Maya center in, oh, in around 600 AD or so, give or take. Classic period. And this is sort of the cliche classic ruler. Uh, if you look at him here now, Pakal died when he was old. He was like 80. He, he was in his 80s. He, he, he had lived a long life. The Maya count in base 20 so uh, Pakal was actually a three Katun Lord, meaning he had ruled over 60 years. A Katun is a cycle of 20 years. Uh, so a three Katun Lord. And what this shows you is first, they, they carved Pakal as a young, um, a, a young king, if you, if you look more closely. He's a young person because, you know, on, on his, um, Upon his burial, he wants to be remembered as a young, vibrant king. You know, carve Pakal as an old guy. You carve him when he's young and strong. You know, just, just like any of us, it's like at our memorial service, we want pictures of us when we were you know, in our prime doing these exciting things. And, and that's, what, that's what we have here. So Pakal, and if you guys look close, you can see him. There's his nose and his head. He's sitting down. There's his knee, his foot. And his hands, his hands are kind of like this. Um, and coming out of him is the world tree. And what this shows you is Pakal is the center of the universe. That's power. If Pakal walked by you, the center of the universe just walked by you. You know, and, and there you go. I mean, what more power can you get? And actually, as you look closer on this, you see these little dots of three. It's like dots of three, dots of three, dots of three, dots of three. That is jade jewelry falling down from the floral paradise, 
where Pakal is going on his journey to the next world. Uh, there's a there's a bird up here, which which relates in in Maya mythology and cosmology in the sky, but also underneath Pakal, uh, there is um, you guys can see there's this clamp sort of looking thing like that 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 those are jaws of a centipede that lives in the underworld so that is an opening to the underworld of shabalba and um pakal is there in the center of it all because he is the lord he is power he's the king you know we are not him he's more than us and this, by the way, you guys, is the carving of his actual sarcophagus, or sarcophagus lid, which I did see I went, when you go to Palenque. Um, this is large. This is like maybe, I'd say maybe 12 or 13 feet long, maybe, you know, like seven feet wide, something like that. It is a huge piece of solid stone. And in order to um, examine his remains in the 1950s, they had to like crank this up you know, with modern technology and Pakal was buried underneath in a massive stone sarcophagus. You know, um, very, very impressive. So there's symbolism upon symbolism in some of these Maya sites. And all you got to do is look. Um, there are for the Maya 13 levels of the floral paradise and there are nine levels of the underworld. And this on the left is, is Temple One at Tikal, the image of the um, uh, planet Yavin in Star Wars that I showed you guys earlier. If you count the steps of the pyramid, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So the Maya were really into kind of numbers and, and almost kind of a numerology sort, sort of thing. And uh, you, when you look closer, you'll, you, you start to see some of, the, some of these patterns. You know, it took, that takes a lot of effort to make a, a huge pyramid like that and, and decide on 13. That's not just an accident. You know, they did that um, for a reason to show. And as you, uh, you know, you could just see it as you climb the pyramid, you are symbolically going up the levels of the floral paradise. You'll never guess who gets to come out here on special occasions. The king, you know, gets to come out and, and give his proclamations right there. Near the, you don't get to go all the way. You're a, you know everyday uh, person. You have to sit here in the, day, in the world of the now. The king is in, is in the world of the, of the beyond. Um, but the, on the flip side, you have the underworld, the world of Shibalba. And uh, Shibal Shibalba is symbolized by three things in our world, it's symbolized by caves. And that makes sense. You go down in a cave and you're going literally into the underworld. It is symbolized by cenotes, like where I work, uh, where, where when you go into the water, you are then into the watery underworld. Uh, and then finally, it's symbolized by the ball game, which, which the reason for, for this is the ball game plays a big role in the Popol Vuh, which is the Maya creation mythology. And the, the ball game has a lot to do with the story of the Popol Vuh and the underworld um, parts of the Popol Vuh often take place in a ball court. They're related to the ball game, this kind of thing. So the ball court itself is seen as kind of like a nexus of, of underworld imagery or energy, if you, if you want to think of it like that. Um, now, with all this, again, Kinkella, what does it have to do with astronomy? Well, uh, I, I've set you up to make this stuff now make sense because you, as an ancient Maya person, you're going to be looking at this from the city, from this cosmogram. You're going to see the pyramid connect to the night sky. It's going to make total sense. You know, um, uh, one of my great joys was having the ability to visit uh, ancient Maya sites at night. It's really, really fascinating and cool because the, the Central American night sky is often just a fantastically dark. You can see the 
Milky Way, no problem, you know. And um, if you're either on top of a pyramid, just looking at the night sky, you feel like you're just in it, you know. Oh, I am part of this night sky. Or even if you're down at the bottom, you, the pyramid look looks like it's this like conduit to up to the night sky. So the actual architecture of the ancient Maya city really draws you in to the to the world in this experiential way. And as I go with the rest of these slides, I can tell you how the ancient Maya kind of um, tied their belief systems to some of these things that you guys, I'm sure, all appreciate. Now, first, the sun. What can I tell you about the ancient Maya and the sun? Um, at some sites, not all, but some, there are things called an e-group. The reason why um, an e-group is called an e-group is, is simply because the very first one ever discovered uh, was, at, was at a site uh, that had just numbered it e. That's all. So there's, there's not a, ooh, what, why the e? What happened to the d-group? You know, it's like they just labeled it on a map e, and then they happened to find this. And so what is an e-group? Well, well, an e-group, and now I have this image to you like I was talking about earlier with the my east is up in, in this image. So in your mind, if you want to turn it 90 degrees, th this, this will make sense. So when you find this, what happens is you'll have a big pyramid and then you'll have a low pyramid with three little ones. And so on a map for us, if the map is north, you'll kind of have this big pyramid and then you'll have bump, 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 you know, and then, but if you stand on top of the pyramid, what you see is, of course, um, the solstice markers and equinox markers, that's what they are. Because if you're there on those days, the sun rises directly above um, the littler pyramids. So it can be, you know, can tell you what time of year it is with just a glance, you know, just depending on where the sun rises, you know what, what time of year it is. Um, these things are really fun to visit and, and experience too. I actually, what, uh, in my younger days in archeology, span I thought, that the E group was named this because again, imagine this is sideways with North up, because if you take this pyramid and then these three, it makes a, a uppercase letter E. You go bump, 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 right? You've made, you make an E with the actual um, architecture. That's what I thought it was. Oh, it's named for the letter. Nope, nope. It's very simple. It's just the first place it was ever found. And since it was found, you can find these at more, more sites. Um, now, what's the moon? I hope, one of my hopes, is to ruin your perception of the moon forever. So when you look at it, all you can see is the rabbit. Now, for a full moon, we classically go with the man in the moon, with the two circles in the mouth. And I always thought, let's be, I always thought it wasn't that great. I'm like, man, the moon. I don't know, man. Can I see it? Yes, I can. But I'm like, eh. Not that creative, but check this out. If, if you're bold and want to look during the next full moon, go outside and see the rabbit. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. How to see the rabbit is, you got, look for the ears. You see the ears right here? There's the head and then the body and the bushy tail. And I swear to you guys, like it really does look like a rabbit. It looks way more like a rabbit than a face. I am in the rabbit fan club, as I'm sure you can tell, <laughs> right? It, it just, I, I love the, the idea of the, of the moon as a rabbit. I just think it, it looks absolutely like one way, especially when you see it in person. Um, now, well, beyond this rabbit, the Maya saw the moon as a goddess. And um, it, actually two forms of the same goddess, uh, Chakchel, when, uh, when the moon is old, so, and then Ischel, when the moon is young. And of course the moon goes through phases. So the Maya are relating to the moon based on the phase. Um, and the, the moon, as we'll see, is, is used for lots of things. The moon is always important for obvious reasons, you know, in, in all cultures. It's this, it's the big bright nighttime thing, you know? You have the big bright daytime thing and the big bright nighttime thing. Um, and often feminine. Uh, so the, the moon goddess is seen as a weaver. She has like a skirt on and sometimes a warrior. Uh, that, 
as as a female, the the moon goddess has ties to fertility and childbirth. And actually, sometimes the moon goddess can be kind of stern, can be kind of tough when you when you read into um, Maya mythology and cosmology, because the the moon will also sometimes relate to planting and farming. And you know, what if the rains don't come? That's the moon goddess. Is you know, maybe you haven't done the right stuff this year. The moon goddess is kind of pissed at you. You know, it, so the moon, what I want to impart to you guys is the moon goddess has an edge. You know, she does, she's tough. Um, so don't trifle with the moon goddess, my friends. Uh, the Maya were really good, as I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard, uh, with recording the night sky, recording eclipses, this kind of thing. And, you know, I always think you would be too if you spent that much time out of doors like the Maya did. And they're, you know, there are people who are interested in their world and interested in, in writing these things down. We spend our lives in these, you know, dead wood boxes. We don't look up that much. They looked up all the time, you know? So, so they, as a culture, you know, got into recording and being close with this and they got really good at it. And with their numbering system and the calendar and all that kind of good stuff, it all kind of relates together. Venus as well is, of course, going to be a major um, uh, player in, in the Maya world. The Venus will, like the moon, has phases that the Maya would talk about. The Ven Venus is seen as either the morning star or the evening star. Very, very obvious for those of us who's looked, looked in the night sky. So bright. The um, Maya would use it as a sign for warfare. This is a good time to... Um, you know, to have war with this next city over. Um, as with so many cultures, Venus is going to be important. It's, it's the brightest object in the sky barring, barring the moon. And then the, the Maya being so into counting and numerology and sort of um, tracking time and calendar. I mean, the fact that five Venus cycles relates into eight Earth years perfectly. Oh, that's great. That, that works right in with the entire sort of Maya ideology of, of how the cosmos works. It's all like interrelated and cycles on cycles. The Maya are all about like cycles on cycles on cycles on cycles. Um, yeah, those, are, those of us who were worried about 2012, that was the um, end of the last great 400 year cycle. So the Maya had cycles all the way up to 400 years. Remember base 20. Uh, so, but of course the Maya did not say that fire and brimstone were going to kill you on the next day. They just said, oh, it's the next day of the next cycle. Yeah. Big deal. You know, the, the Maya were grown ups, friends, you know, they just, they just clicked their calendar. They just pulled it. It's, it's just December 31st, 1999 became January 1st, 2000. Same thing. You know, they, they just, they had more, they had, uh, uh, more things to change that one day. Um, and you will also, as, as I finally have here, have, have some symbolism with death and resurrection with the morning star, evening star, you know, showing, showing itself on different, at different times of the year. Makes sense. Um, for the constellations, I'm sure the Maya had more constellations than this. And, and while I don't have to guess too much on the moon or the sun or Venus, when it comes to the con constellations, I'm walking out on a skinnier branch. And what I mean here is welcome to archaeology, everyone. Uh, and what this means is we are reconstructing things that from information that's a thousand years old or 1500 years old, or if we're lucky, only 500 years old, you know? So if you hear differently, if you hear different people talk, talk about these things slightly differently, it's not that they're wrong uh, and, and it's not that I'm right. It's these, we are looking at very scant evidence and making a our best educated guess. Um, I want everyone to realize that in archeology, span it's always an educated guess. It's not just a fantasy, right? We're, we're, we have very little um, data, but with the data we have, we go for it. So what do we got for constellations? Um, first, Scorpio for the Maya is also a scorpion. I think it makes sense. And, and also when you're in Central America um, in the summer, Scorpio is so vibrant and high. It's lower in the sky for us because we're at about what 34 degrees. You know, for the um, for the ancient Maya, they're at like 
20 degrees, you know, in, in that, in that vicinity, 19 degrees, I think in Belize where I work, I think it's about 19. So, um, so the, uh, Scorpio is going to be high and prominent. I'm telling you, it is the like summer constellation. It's absolutely bright and arresting in the night sky. Now, uh, what is this image? This is a rollout, uh, from what was originally a vase. You know, and so they've taken the the photo and just made it flat. And there there's a lot going on here. This is this is one of the hero twins, which are the the central players in the Popol Vu in the Maya creation mythology. And there's oh, you guys, there's so many good side stories to this. Oh, Popol Vu has has so much. I, I this it, this is just a tiny side story in in all this fantastic stuff. If you're into the Popol Vuh, um, I highly recommend, you can find this on YouTube, the cartoon, the Popol Vuh cartoon that came out really in the 1970s. They used um, images like this and pixelated them to tell the story of the Maya Popol Vuh. It's fascinating. It won all kinds of awards. Um, I highly recommend the Popol Vuh. It's, I think it's just called Popol Vuh, you know, but it's the, it's the late 1970s. You'll find it. Um, it's an excellent telling of the Popol Vuh. The Popol Vuh story. But here we have uh, Hunapu, which is one of the hero twins. He has black dots on him, which means he's dead. And he has, he's in the other world or has died and resurrected. Um, he's wearing a hat. You see the guy, that very good rendition of a hat made out of thatch, basically, that they still make today. Hunters wear the hat. So it's saying like, this guy is a hunter and he has a blow dart. And he's shooting out the old bird in the tree. Um, one of the things about the hero twins is what they're here to do is to cleanse the earth from like the last cycle. Like basically to the Maya, every time there's a new cycle, it's like a cleansing and a rebirth, but it's never quite perfect. There's little bits left over from like the last time. Like it just, we didn't clean quite perfect. So the hero twins are cleaning it and making the new world nice for us, you know? Um, and so here he's, he's shoot, he's killing the old bird, which is, which is from this sort of past cycle. Oh, there's so much more to it. But in the sky, this is likely happening in the summer because Scorpio is there now. And, and I think he, those of you guys who are fans of Scorpio, who, who isn't, um, Again, you know, it's so prominent, so obvious. I, I, I think it is one of those times where it looks like a scorpion. You know, uh, those of us who have other zodiac signs, like um, I'm a Pisces, the, the least of the constellations, let's be honest, let's be honest, Pisces. You know, it doesn't look like anything, you know? Um, it, it doesn't. I, I, you guys love astronomy and and was really into astronomy when I was a kid I had a telescope and everything and I and I looked at Pisces and I was like I was like 12 you know and I'm like man <laughs> so my point being that for the Maya I highly doubt they're gonna call Pisces two fish but I can totally see the scorpion thing plus you find scorpions in the Maya world all the time so it's a natural um, use of of your own environment uh, also, Castor and Pollux Gemini is seen as two peccaries, um, and not just two, two peccaries, two copulating peccaries. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. PG-13 in the night sky. Yes, yes, by oh, the ancient Maya. Um, so, and peccaries, peccaries are like these little pigs uh, that, that people will even have, have as pets, and they're very smart. Pigs, if, if you guys know, are smarter than dogs. Um, they're, they're very smart. They actually make very good pets. Um, a friend of mine did have a pet peccary uh, in, in Belize one year, and I hung out with the peccary some. They're, they're small. and uh, They're kind of cute. But, but you could see the Maya using two peccaries as the sort of castor and pollux, very obvious, you know, these two bright together stars. Um, and then finally Orion. And what's funny is for, uh, of the three, you probably think Orion's probably the m number one most obvious of them all, almost kind of very wintry. Uh, but the Maya see two things here. First, they see a turtle. And now you're like, what? Turtle? Um, and they also see what, what we would call the three stone hearth. Now, 
the turtle is i like the image on the right actually a little better for this sometimes the maya oh, i don't have it i don't have an image of this but sometimes sometimes the maya will draw a turtle with really elongated legs it's just kind of like a artistic flair aspect of it it's not that turtles in the maya world have long legs they don't but but it's just part of the the drawing so sometimes i could see it as being like the turtle kind of car carapace, the turtle shell, shell is here. And then the four legs like stretching out to the main stars of, of Orion. I could see that um, for the Maya world. It's also th the three stars can be seen as just the three stone hearth, which is an image of centrality. Um, every Maya household has three stones that the, that the cooking, uh, the komal, it's called the sort of the thing you cook on is held on. So these three stones are seen as like centrality, the hearth, home, you know, th this kind of thing. And, and those three in Orion's belt are so obvious. So how do I know all this? Have I pulled it out of thin air? No. Again, archaeologists do this based on facts and data. Where do I get my data? I get it from a couple different sources. First are the Maya codices, um, which are the Maya paper books. There used to be thousands of these. Now there are four because the Spanish burned them. Yes, one of the greatest losses of human knowledge ever in a swoop, right? There are four. And I'm here to tell you guys, like of the four, one of them's in good shape and the other three, you know, some pages are missing. They're almost up. This is from the good one. Now, what, what, what can I get? What can we get from this to learn about the night sky? Sometimes there's things like, if you look here, this image going across, this is a sky band. And without going too deep, uh, it, it just says a sky stuff is happening here when you see, see that kind of thing. And, the, and then also here, ah, yeah, you can kind of, this is a stylized turtle. Look at the longer legs coming out. You know, you can kind of get that if you're looking at Orion. Um, and down here, yeah, they might have some peccary stuff going on. But see, this is, this is so typical. Actually, I love this image. This is from the Paris Codex. Um, see how the edges, they're just all gone. So you just have in these pages, you have like the center bit and these are the good pages. Some pages of the Paris Codex, you got like little bits in the corner and the rest is totally missing. So um, we're lucky to see sky turtle. Okay, you know, um, you, you go for other sources too. These are the Bonham Park murals. If this is a sort of a rollout of that to this bottom part, Think of this, you guys, if it's, if it's painted on the inside of like, you, you, know, you know how a dog house is built, how it's, how it's got sort of a simple roof and then the four sides, two long sides, two shorts, right? This kind of imagery, if you were going into a room like that. So this is much bigger than what a dog house would be, but it has the same basic construction. So what you're seeing is these squares are the two sides and then these are the images from the far, from the, from the far sides, you know, and it angles in because it's got like a peaked roof. At the top of the roof, the, the, these are the rollouts. You can see some imagery and this up here is just a zoom in of this up here. Two peccaries, two copulating peccar peccaries right here and two, uh, um, I'm sorry, the uh, turtle here. These images are tougher. We think they might be images of, the, of planets. Um, like Mars and Saturn, but that to me, um, I'm a little more, sh that's way out on the skinny branch. Uh, but, but it makes sense that this imagery, it's at the top of this mural laden room, you know, so that's more evidence that we use. And then this is just a stylized Im image of, of putting some of this stuff into the night sky with the Milky Way, uh, just to show how the Maya might've seen this, but there's so much more. And I guarantee you they had more constellations, you know. Um, the Milky Way itself is one of my favorite parts. The Milky Way is the road for dead souls to take to the floral paradise. So the king who's here is paddled up to the floral paradise, right, by, by the paddler gods. And, how do, and the king always has his hand like this when, he, when, when he's dead. It's like, it's, it's like he's, he's fainting. It's like, ah. Being a dead king is very difficult work, my friends. Ah, oh, tired, right? He does it always. So when you see this, see it, right? It's that's it tells you like I'm on my way, Florida. Um, 
and how do we know this? There's imagery like this. This is carved on a human bone from, from Tikal. So that, I mean, pretty important. And you have these other gods with the king in the center, paddler gods on either side, taking the canoe up, uh, up, the, up the floral paradise. There's a, um, sometimes I believe that's a water lily um, coming off his head. And, and, and again, there's imagery, sort of the, the, the Milky Way as a, as, a, as a river paddling up or, or as a road. In, in ancient Maya, to enter the road means to die or to enter the water means to die, right? You didn't go swimming, you didn't go on a trip, you died. Um, now, finally, I, I know we're just at about time here. Um, I thought I'd spend my last handful of minutes just talking about what it means to me, like in my experience of seeing these things. What, what you know, um, how did it affect me? Somebody who enjoys astronomy is a is a backyard astronomer um to to try and 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 brag my my dad took some classes in san francisco with dobson and made a dobsonian telescope you know so i i know that that world um uh, and so the the reason for me to say this is it was always in the back of my mind when i would experience the maya sky so what experiences did i have um, there, there's a handful that, that, you know, my students ask about sometimes one was I had to cross the river once at night during basically a flood. And the setup was that I had to get across the river because my plane was taking off in the morning and I had to make it to Belize city. And I was on the wrong side of the river and in, in a place like Belize in certain areas, and we were way out there, if you're on the wrong side of the river, that's a major problem especially when it's, it wasn't at flood stage yet, but it was at angry stage, if that makes sense. I mean, it was, you know, going up and things like big trees were coming down the river, you know, as you go. And I was like, oh my God, I thought I was trapped. And John Carr, who was the owner of Banana Bank Lodge, where we used to stay, he's a, he's a Montana cowboy who's lived in Belize since the seventies. I was like, John, I think I'm trapped. And he's like, he's like, I'll get you across. And I'm like, really and i'm telling you guys this was a john wayne moment you know where this is the boat um and, and how you cross this is the river on a happy day um there's actually a rope above this that you can't see and and so that somebody stands in the boat and pulls the boat across to the other side and um and, and uh we went down to the boat and it, the, the river is just <laughs> you know, go, like going down trees and whatever. I'm like, John, how are we going to do this? He's like, you hold the flashlight. So I sat on the side and held the flashlight looking for like huge trees. And he's just like, you know, just tell me if one comes. And he just starts going across, right? And he just starts pulling me across. This old Montana cowboy pulling me across as I'm holding my flashlight, you know, hoping that a tree just doesn't take us out at night, you know, on the Belize River. And I can hear these like roots going like, bam, bam, you know, like on, this is a, uh, this is a metal boat. So kang, 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 you know, as we're going across. And as this is happening, and as I'm freaking out, I look up and Scorpio is just like, oh, and I swear to God, you guys, it almost, it like chokes me up. Like it was, I, I, I can't describe like what it meant at that moment, you know, when, <laughs> when a Montana cowboy is saving my ass, you know, and, and it just, I will, I'll, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. You know, see, look at me. I'm all like, I'm like choked up. I'm delivering on this presentation, my friends. Um, so next, uh, other things I've learned. I remember when um, I went with my parents, the very first time I was ever in the Maya world, we visited Chichen Itza and went, there's me when I was like 20, I think, and, and my, my brother. And we went to see the night, the, the, at, at night, they did this horrendously cheesy, horrible light show. But we went to go see it just for laughs. But what happened was you, you go and you like sit on the steps or whatever and you wait for the lights to start and, and they have like they've dug holes this stuff they're like big lights come up and they have this awful narration 
you know, this B movie Hollywood star is doing it. I'm telling you guys, it's terrible. Um, but the best part of the whole show was right before they turned it on, they had to turn all the lights off. They turned all the lights off and everyone there went, <gasps> because they saw the night sky and it was like so fascinating. You know, like it, the night sky was so beautiful that 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 was the best part of the whole show all they had to do was keep the lights off um i also learned that the maya um could navigate by night the name of the roads is sock bay and that means white road in in mine because of the marl the natural limestone just like cara blanca white face they use that same stuff to make the roads and so at night the road will, you can still see it even with moonlight. Um, the, the moon is used for planting in the ancient Maya world. Uh, they like the, the, the local Belizeans will be like, oh, Andrew, it's, it's a good time to plant. And I'd be like, why? They're like, cause there's a ring around the moon. Now that's just, that's not just idle belief. That's uh, because you get a ring around the moon when there's a lot of moisture in the, in the air. So it's going to rain soon. So it's a good time to plant, you know? So you're going to look at the night sky and, and use this kind of stuff even today. And then finally, this is just something for me as, a, uh, as an astronomy buff, I always wanted to see the Southern Cross. And on one of the nights, the very first time I ever went to Belize, I, had, I looked over and I was like, wait, what? Oh my God right that's it and it is if you guys have never seen it oh my god you gotta see it it's so like tight is is sort of the 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 description i would give for it we're used to you know so many of the constellations are big but if you can go to a place like central america and see it at the right time of year it's it's like this tight bright um uh cross and and i had a friend who was from new zealand and he's like oh those are the pointers you know, so you have the two bright pointer stars and, and they point you to the Southern Cross. Anyway, that's um, that's my tale, that's my show, that's what I got. Uh, if you wanna get in touch with me, there's my email address right there. Um, actually, almost easier, I have a YouTube channel called Kinkella Teaches Archeology. span Feel free to put a, a comment on any of the videos because I get notified that the comments come no matter what video it is. And that's very easy for me to type back um, I've recently been on, on television once or twice on, on a show called What on Earth and on Ancient Unexplained Files, both on the Science Channel. So you can see me much like this um, in a square talking about uh, archaeology. And, and these people are just um, uh, special thanks to those who, who really helped me throughout my career, Lisa, for um, being so supportive of what I've done, Tony Rath for taking some of these very excellent photos, Marty O'Farrell for being uh, one of the, the world's best dive buddies and he took some of the photos too, the Carr family um, who we stayed with, and then finally the Belize Institute of Archaeology for making it all possible. There you go. And Andrew, fantastic. I really enjoyed your talk once again. And this time I was able to take notes. So I, I, I can guarantee you this. Uh, we had, uh, I'm monitoring our YouTube channel. We did have people watching. And what happens is a lot of people aren't able to make it. And I'll forward the link over this weekend, but I'll make sure to include the link to your archaeology uh Kinkella teaches archaeology yeah. youtube channel as well so that way people can put the two together and see for themselves fantastic oh by the way over the last couple of days i have been uh re-watching as much as i could of what on earth i haven't found you yet i have I'm, not found you yet i'm late there's a there's a there's only a handful of times there's one on the um stepped pyramid uh, uh, of Saqqara in Egypt that, that I'm, I'm on. And there's there's one or two others. There's a ritual site in Spain. Um, they just, for those of us who work on those kind of shows, they just kind of sprinkle us out throughout and you never know until you watch it, you know, which one you're gonna, gonna be in. I, I get it, I get it. I, as I was saying uh, a couple of days ago when we were doing our tech rehearsal, Dr. Mark Raymond, who works for JPL, he's even, I've even seen him on Ancient Aliens. Oh yeah. So, it's a, yeah. it's a small world, that stuff. And, and so it's only a handful of 
of the same sort of production companies who, who make those, who interview people, who get in touch with, you know, kind of specialists in these, in these areas. And, and Great. So let me go ahead and seed the first question and kind of bait the audience a little bit, and then I'll back out on this. Uh, as I'm looking at Pakal the Great, and I'm looking at his tombstone cover, I have seen that on Ancient Aliens, and they say he's in a rocket ship. Now, I want to hear what you have to, I, yeah, I, I mean, it's an entertaining show. I take it with a grain of salt because it's very entertaining. But from Ventura County Archaeological Society, sir, um, what is your take? Well, Ancient Aliens is, of course, right. And I'm just <laughs> thought it's time that I tell the world. Um, no, you know, you know what bothers me? So Ancient Aliens, people think I hate Ancient Aliens, but I don't. Um, I, I appreciate certain things about them. I appreciate their production value. Mm -hmm. Ancient does a does a pretty mean show. And I do have to say for people who are first getting into archaeology, when I was a kid, I loved In Search Of. If anyone remembers that, the Leonard yes. Nimoy, you know, yes. it was so like, certain parts of it were like creepy and, you know, mysterious. And they do something on like Easter Island and play the spooky music, you know. And, and of course, all that stuff is false. But I don't mind the hook. Like, I, I'm happy if somebody watches Ancient Aliens and then goes, hey, this archaeology thing looks cool. Maybe I'll take an archaeology class. Great. Now, now in terms of, is Ancient Aliens true? No. <laughs> um, I and, know. And I think that I have to ruin it. Because don't we all want Ancient Aliens to be true? Of course we do. Don't you want Pakal to be, like, in a spaceship, like, doing his controls and stuff? <laughs> Do. guilty I, I know everyone does it's like it's like if i if i took a vote like how many of you want there to be a loch ness monster totally yes so <laughs> ancient aliens plays on your wants you know um and we, we all want it and then what it forces me to be the egghead who has to go well i'm sorry you guys but uh it's not true and everyone goes boo egghead shut up you know um which i which i understand because I want Pakal to, to drive a spaceship, but he's not. And um, if you actually dive into um, some of those stories you hear a lot, like Pakal being in the rocket ship or whatever, they're ultimately from, um, oh, I forget the name of the book. It came out in the late 60s. Eric von Dynekin. Um, oh, oh, yes, Chari yes, uh, Chari yes. Chariots of the Gods. Um, and so actually they're just retreads from Chariots of the Gods. And, and what I find is for a discerning audience, especially for young people, that that Pakal story is pretty thin. It's honestly, it's pretty lame. Like yeah. it's basically because his hands are like this and I showed you, it's like, I'm, I'm dead, I'm going up. To, you know, he's doing the, a version of that. And it's the, the idea is since his hands are like this, he's supposed to be doing his controls. It's like, yeah, you know, <laughs> know, you know and, and, and just cause he's sitting like this and it also shows its age because he's sitting like you would in an Apollo mission, you know, like, like that's not, that's not space shuttle material. They're, they're, no. they're going from 1969, not, not later. So it just shows you how much they retread on ancient aliens. Like, yes, but that brings us back to uh, their mythos because their explanations of how the world came about um, pretty much was driven by their wants too. For the ancient Maya, you mean? Yes. Yeah, um, I, I mean, their, their world, it, it's, it, there's, Things like if you if you dive into the Popol Vuh, which man I recommend everyone does. It, it I will. Basically begins with you know in 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 the beginning there was nothing, and then light came basically, and then there was light, and then the gods came, and the and uh, in order to create humans, the gods tried three times. You know, at first they tried uh, mud and it didn't work, then they tried sticks, then it didn't work, but the third time they used corn and it worked. So what you're going to find in the Popol Vuh is so much of it rotates on corn and the idea of corn and the idea of rain to bring the corn. That's, it's at the basis of the whole thing. That was their Teosinte? Yeah. So Teosinte is the original um, where corn come, comes from. Teosinte looks like wheat. Yes. Uh, it, it just has like kernels stuck together. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Maya, the Maya, the reason why you have corn on the cob is the Maya. Thank you, Ancient Maya, for making corn on the top. <laughs> Artificial selection of teosinte. So what they did was the original eight um, seeds of teosinte, it's just 
eight seeds. There was there was ultimately a genetic mutation where they had 16 seeds. And then you have another genetic mutation where there's a little cob this big and then so on and so forth. You get big cobs today. It's all um, artificial selection, just like you get a chihuahua from a wolf. It's the same thing. Andrew, I've enjoyed this talk. Let me back out so other people can ask some questions. Anything. Sure. So we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Again, thank you very much. Very entertaining and informative talk, Andrew. Um, I'm combining a couple of questions here. People want to know, what's the current status of that area? Is it uh, habited anymore? Is it the way that you showed it all, all in a secluded jungle? And you also mentioned come up, some of them are made into... Um, not so appealing touristic sites with uh, shows that's uh, not good. So yeah. what's the current situation there uh, in terms of preserving them, habitability, uh, people there? Sure, sure. That's a big question. The, the short answer is yes to all of the above. Um, and what I mean by that is, well, that, that, that light show thing I showed you was from uh, Chichen Itza. And Chichen Itza is like, like a, it's, it's almost the most touristed site, you know, in all the my world. Um, it, it's a day trip from Cancun, you know, so lots and lots of people go there. So they felt at one point they had to put it in. Uh, but that's, that's a rarity, um, a, a sort of a, a sort of a cheesy show like that. That's really rare. And I don't even know if they still do it. Um, but most of the other Maya sites are they're They're a bit harder to get to. Um, you, you, you can still get there. It's not like you need to rent a mule and walk for 30 days. You know, you can still rent a car or go with um, a tourist group. Uh, but, but most of them are a little more remote. Um, they're, they're managed. It depends on the country. Each country, each country has like a, an archaeology department or an institute, like in Belize, it's the Institute of Archaeology in Belize. They, they have like park rangers and stuff. So, so a typical site, if there's one, will have a little like kiosk at, a, at the front and a sign and maybe a map. And, th and then you can just kind of spend the day cruising around and experiencing the site for yourself, kind of following the map. Um, and they, and they run guided tours all the time too. It really depends. So, some sites are really big, some sites are small, some sites, it, it depends on how you can get there. Now for the Carablanca pools, which actually my, my image, this is just an image I took when I was um, uh, in the Carablanca area. Those, a lot of it is still jungly, but some of it has been started to be developed and it's really hard for me to see, you know, some portions of the jungle being cut down. And um, they, had a, uh, they had a hurricane that came through there about 10 years ago. It was only a, only a category one, but those are the ones that bar barely, it was Hurricane Richard, uh, I think 2010 or so. And what happened in that area was, so the hurricane comes through, category one can still be quite devastating. A lot of the big trees fell down. And then that summer, a bunch of them caught on fire because you have a bunch of dead trees and then you have fire. And so, uh, and so there was a big portion of the, of the jungle that was ruined then. What I will say is in terms of, the status of these places, again, it's all, all over the map, but as an archeologist who works in a place like that, wherever it may be, where you have like natural resources, you kind of naturally become an environment defender as the years go by, because you experience these fantastic things and then you learn that they're in peril or they've been cut down or whatever. And it's, you know, it's really awful. So I'm a big fan of trying to preserve the rainforest. Thank you. And uh, so you mentioned that these sites cover a lot of nowadays countries. Uh, back then, what was the extent of the Mayan world? How how square kilometers or miles have this discovered and uh, how big were they? Big. I don't know the kilometer number because it's huge. It's basically the entire country of Guatemala. If, if you want to pick one country that's kind of the most Maya or something. I, I guess I would argue Guatemala because the, Guatemala probably has the most um, large Maya sites. It's kind of in the, it's in the center of the Maya world. So if you look at a, at a political map and you see Guatemala, it's like, that's kind of the center of the Maya world. But the Maya world extends from Guatemala through the Yucatan Peninsula, that Southern Mexico thing, all of Belize, and then the western side of El Salvador and, and Honduras. So it's a massive area and that's all populated all during that time. More people live there then than do now. 
Very interesting. Uh, we have another question about the significance of total solar eclipses to the Mayans. Ooh, um, I, I, all I can say is that they 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 tracked them and and they they would talk about them. I can't think of anything specific off the top of my head. You know, like uh, that that a certain thing would happen or it had some certain special meaning in in like the mythology or, or or anything like that but they would they would definitely have experienced it and know you know and 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 gotten ready for it it's the best i can do i wish there was more uh that, that that's that's about all i can say about it about a total solar eclipse okay now next uh, we have a person who has visited a couple of uh, those sites and expresses his disappointment of uh, use the, the Spaniard names being used for them and how people have assumed what those buildings are for. So uh, he wants to know if archaeologists have uh, exact answers or what those buildings were for. You, you mentioned that E group and stuff. Um, so uh, are there any oral history remaining from existing Mayans to give us clues on what exactly those buildings were for? A lot of times there's not, sometimes there is. I love that question, it's an excellent question because actually as you, as you cruise through the Maya world, um, sites are named for all different kinds of things. There are a handful that do have their original Maya name. The site of Lamanai in Belize, that is, the, and that means submerged crocodile. Um, the site of Lamanai, that is the original Maya name and we happen to know that. Um, so that's awesome, but that doesn't happen every time. Sometimes you're lucky, because the Maya had writing and stuff, which is great. So sometimes you're lucky enough to find a hieroglyph that does have the, the name, you know, the, the city name on it. And then you can use that. Other times you just don't. Um, th and, and they're named for all kinds of things. Sometimes it's the, like the town that's close by. Um, sometimes it's a person who lived there or an event that happened. They're named for everything you know um and and all different kinds it's like like in in belize some of the names will be in english because belize used to be british honduras and the you know um Eng english still is kind of the national language um there are sites that are that are named in spanish some that are in mayan some that are in in mayan but it's not the actual maya name it's a later maya name that they put on it so there's it's <laughs> it's another one of those questions where, where you have to go with specific you have to like visit a specific place and see what the history is because just the oh, the last you know 500 years of naming uh, areas is is its own history so yeah it's it's very lot in terms of um local people um like knowing like like modern maya people uh, knowing what a structure of the past was for it just depends sometimes Sometimes certain certain things that, that you find in the ancient past have really close uh, similarities to, to modern stuff, and and like a a Maya person can be like, oh yeah, this was used for this, and and, and their and their oral history or whatever can be a big help. Other times, it's it's not, and and it just goes with with like any cultural group. There's change over time. Like Maya from 800 AD don't do the same stuff from Maya of 1200 AD or 1600 AD. So it just depends. It's, it's always worth it to um, ask uh, the, the local people these kinds of things or, oh, do you remember or have you heard or do you know, you know, like that, that's always, always uh, a worthwhile avenue to, to explore. But archaeology, man, uh, you know, you, you, you never have the whole answer. Right. <clears throat> Now, the, the other question involves the current inhabitants of this area and, and those sites. So what's the level of interest in astronomy or in history in the people currently residing at those areas or around? In, well, g given that it spans multiple countries, I think the question would be how people in those countries are interested, how much interest there is in the Mayan uh, history and, or astronomy in those people, uh, those, among those people. My guess would be again, we're, yeah, we're 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 going across so many you know places and cultures and cities. Um, it, it's just going to depend. I think I think for astronomy, that's a harder one to answer. And I would I would tend to guess that most you know most people who are doing astronomy there would be doing it in much more the same way we would 
teach astronomy in college or something, they'd be interested in astronomy, but they would name the constellations, the constellations of the zodiac, you know, and this, they, they, would, they would use um, the, the sort of Western terminology for that stuff probably much more often. But when it comes to um, the ancient Maya as a culture, uh, I would say they are vibrant. Uh, re remember, there are like 8 million modern Maya people living in the, in the Maya world. And um, they, they didn't experience nearly as, mu as much of a uh, devastating blow as some of the other cultures in the Americas experienced, you know, um, during contact and stuff. They, they did, you know, well, they still have their language, they still have their land, they're still, you know, they're, they're, they're still doing their thing. You can go to a Maya village today where people speak Mayan, you know, that's, that kind of says it all. Um, and they're, they're really into oh, keeping, keeping their history alive and vibrant and um, teaching it and, you know, having the younger generation get, get into it. And uh, it's, it's really cool. Stuff like computers uh, and, and internet and all that has really helped uh, expand sort of the teaching and the, and the storage of knowledge of, of some of some of the modern Maya stuff. It's, it's really, it's really cool. And it's really fun to see what, what is so similar from maybe a thousand years ago and what has changed and see the, um, because the, the modern Maya culture, it's not static, it's vibrant, it's new. It's always, you know, it's, it's Mayan, but it's, they're not trying to be people from 800 AD. They're, you know, they're, they're doing their thing. Excellent. Thank you. And for the last question, you have a geology question. So you mentioned those uh, string of pools. Yeah. Uh, so what process generated those pools? Are they like a string of fissures we have seen with lava flowing out or uh, how do they come about? Well, all you have to do is kill the dinosaurs and you get them. And what I mean by that is those were actually formed because of the, of the, um, shockwave for the crater that that hit in 60 at 66 million years ago that hit in the maya like in the northern yucatan that's where the crater is so the the crater so big that it that it kind of cracked the limestone and especially in the northern yucatan there's so many cenotes that have formed based on kind of where these cracks are and stuff now on top of that limestone is intrinsically porous and it it kind of rots or eats, gets eaten away over time by water so uh we don't experience this in california at all but but if you go somewhere maybe like florida or you know in in that in that range where there's limestone sinkholes are a natural aspect of this this sort of swiss cheesed world um and they just call you know they it it gets eaten away it gets too too weak and it collapses straight down so the walls are the walls are very sheer um it really is like a well sort of thing. And that's why they're formed. It's because of the geology of the place. And a special thank you to the asteroid um, that, that gave us even more than there already would have been. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, this covers all the questions from the audience. Uh, let me put it back on the uh, panelists if you have they have any questions. I'm Todd. good. <laughs> oh, hey. Todd. Um, so... Uh, I, I was uh, admiring your map when you when you were showing the map of the cenote. Um, I dabble in maps. So, how much do you um, use GIS in your like tracking, um, looking at trends and things like that? Ooh, oh, I can talk. Uh, I'll, I'll try and make this short. Um, so, so obviously, with with what I what I what I did for my dissertation is. Um, I actually did a, oh, uh, how wide was it? I think it was a 400 meter wide and about, I forget, 11 kilometers long, like, like a long skinny transect through the jungle, right? Where I mapped everything, everything in this long skinny transect. And I started from, from a larger Maya center called Galbach, which was in our area that has pyramids and stuff. And then I went out to the pools and then along the pools mapping in everything in the in the 400 meter wide you know several kilometers long transect that crossed all the pools because i wanted to map what was around the pools and so using so in doing that first we used all kinds of stuff i've used i've used everything like from from your basic uh compass 
to a Brunton compass, which is a more exact compass, to a uh, GP. Oh, and my GPS unit there, uh, green. My GPS unit, yeah. which just happens to be right next to me, um, uh, uh, to a, a field light, a full on transit with, you know, like you see if you see um, Caltrans workers working on the freeway, you know, that kind of thing. And then on top of that, GIS as well. I would say for my needs, um, I've used more classic mapping and less GIS, which is funny because GIS is usually just the, just the golden ticket in archaeology. If you say you have experience in GIS, everyone's like, oh, can you work for my project? You have GIS. You know, it's, it, it's sort of seen as this magical thing. But what I find also in working in a far out jungle place is computer things break. Jungle don't like computer things. So, but, but if you have like a, a GPS unit that's pretty sturdy or even better, a compass that don't break ever, you know, I've found that old school classic map making um, is all, I, I did it with uh, adding GPS uh, points every so often to kind of keep everything straight. Um, but GIS, is used later on a lot of times, like after you bring all the stuff home, then you can kind of put the layering on and stuff. I, I, I've done a decent amount of GIS on other projects, but this one, and it's funny, this one's kind of one layer. And for those of you who don't know, GIS is often you layer things on, like right. you show different things per layer. Um, and and for this one, it it's kind of like, here's the ground and here's the structures on it, you know, so that's. That's what I, I, I'm sure, you know, I did it a while back. If I did it now, I'd probably use more GIS. Oh, my last, my last addition to that too. Uh, in order to get a um, point, you need to get at least three satellites to be hearing your GPS unit. You're in the jungle where there's much tree canopy. So how many days did I spend going like, oh, please, please, three, yes, three, three, you know, and so, and three satellites doesn't give you the kind of accuracy that, you know, people are used to here. You're, you aren't getting no three centimeters, you know? So anyway, that's, that's what I did. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any other questions from the uh, panelists? Okay. looks like that. Excellent. So again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kinkella. That was a fascinating talk. Uh, before we close out the meeting, do you have any final remarks to make? No, I just, um, I, with the exception of, I, I really enjoy being here. Um, I really appreciate uh, you, you guys. And by you guys, I mean the Astronomy Society and just your interest in the natural world. Um, I always like just talking about astronomy. I am a not that secret nerd of astronomy, you know, like I'm, I'm happy to talk about uh, <laughs> reflectors versus refractors or, you know, any, 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 of the, any, any of that kind of stuff. Um, if anyone gets in contact with me uh, over my YouTube channel or whatever, I'm happy to talk about like pure astronomy stuff, you know, to, uh, too. So um, I just, uh, I guess I would just end with a blanket. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching. Um, I hope every, uh, I hope everyone the best in these tough times, but things are getting better. So I hope we can kind of smile a bit, you know. Thank you very much, Keith. I want to thank you, Reza, for hosting us once again. Thank you from Mission Control in the Wayback Machine somewhere in time. Uh, David Contreras, deep underneath the earth with George Norrie um, and Todd Mitchell from Ojai. Uh, Andrew Kinkella, deep within the rainforests behind you. It has been a fantastic night. Looking forward to seeing you all again next month of which I don't have a speaker lined up yet. We will let you know. But in the meantime, looking forward to when this is all over and that we can all meet together it's going to be a big party. Andrew, you're invited. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, guys. Excellent. Thank you. So as a reminder, the next VCAS general meeting is going to be on Friday, February 20th. Uh, I said that once wrong. Uh, April 20th. And uh, you can help us make these meetings better by taking a minute to fill out a survey that should be already open in your browser. With this, I wish you great times ahead and see you all next month. Bye.